Welcome to the Blue Security Podcast, a weekly podcast for information security defenders, where we bring you discussions on best practices, tools, and implementation for enterprise security. Now, here are your hosts for today's show, Andy Ja and Adam Brewer. Welcome to this week's episode of the Blue Security Podcast. I'm Andy, your host. I'm Adam, your co-host. We're going to do a bit of a news smash this week. There has been a lot of news in the InfoSec world. I subscribe myself to several RSS feeds. And to be honest, I have not even had time to browse and peruse all of the news that has come through uh, to even put in to talk about for the news. So I quickly did that uh, over this last week, picked out a couple of things that I thought were interesting that we're going to chat about tonight. This is certainly not a comprehensive news smash for the last couple of weeks, but uh, this will be a pretty good one. So starting with today, Apple released a an update for Mac OS, iOS, and Pad I, uh, OS, iPad OS, which uh, corrected a bunch of security flaws. One of the vulnerabilities that was in Mac OS actually allowed the attackers to bypass a core OS security mechanic. And two of them were zero days at the time when they were disclosed. And there were several that allowed arbitrary code execution within the kernel level privileges on vulnerable devices. There were 13 vulnerabilities total in Mac OS, 10 in iOS and pad OS. What I found interesting was this. So as I mentioned, there was one that allowed the attackers to bypass a core OS security mechanism. That core mechanism was dubbed as CVE 2022-22583, and it was tied to uh, the system integrity protection mechanism in the Mac OS system, or otherwise known as SIP. I didn't know this, so that's why I'm talking about it which I learned as I was reading through this, Apple released SIP in 2015 as malware prevention and overall security enhancement mechanism within the Mac OS system. And it works by prohibiting attackers, even those with root access from doing things like loading kernel drivers and writing to certain directories. So I didn't know that that existed in Mac OS. It's really cool that Apple released that several years ago. And this was one of two bypasses for the SIP mechanism that were found in the last few months. Apple has patched both of them. So this is just to say, make sure you're patching. I know both Adam and I, we have iOS devices that have Microsoft's Defender for Endpoint app on it. And you know through Microsoft IT and IT security, we get an update every time there's a security patch for the phone. And so mine pinged this morning when I started it up and it said, hey, you need to update to iOS 15.3. And so I did that right away because if I don't, I get my access revoked. So these are all um, critical vulnerabilities that should be updated. So make sure you're updating your iOS devices and your macOS devices. Last thing you talked about first Microsoft uses, this is Microsoft IT we're talking about here, uses the capability of Intune plus Azure Active Directory to enforce that you are updating and patching your operating system in a timely fashion. So what they're actually doing under the covers is they have a compliance policy in Intune that they update and they usually give you about a week to say your operating system version must be 15.3 15.3 or later, like in the case of iOS, and then they'll turn that on. And if you haven't installed 15.3, guess what? Can't get to SharePoint, can't get to email, can't get to Microsoft Teams anymore. This is a very desirable security posture. And I know from my time in enterprise IT, that feels too aggressive for a lot of IT shops, but this is where we should really be trying to get to. We do this on our Windows PCs that we manage for you know, our enterprises, why aren't we mandating at least a similar level of update cadence for personally owned devices? I've never quite understood this. And, and usually it's extremely lenient, like allowing, you know, current minus one version of the operating system to go on. And on that note, the second thing I wanted to talk about related to this is 
Apple also recently made a change to security updates on iOS. So if you'll recall when iOS 15 came out, one thing Apple did that was a little unique this year is you could stay on iOS 14 and continue to receive security updates. This was the first time ever that Apple was going to continue to patch the minus one, so the previous release of iOS. Uh, up until that point, whenever a new version came out, iOS 12, iOS 13, immediately the previous version stopped receiving security updates. If you are not on the newest iOS, you are not secure, essentially. And so this was the first time Apple said, no, you can stay on iOS 14 if you want. You don't have to come to 15. And people thought that meant they were going to support minus one the whole way through. So like you could stay on iOS 14 till iOS 16 came out and then you could, you know, go minus one and stay on 15. That's not what happened. Uh, about a month ago, Apple stopped shipping, maybe two months ago, stopped shipping security updates for iOS 14. So now you do have to be on iOS 15 to continue to receive security patches on iOS again. And that's kind of back to the way Apple had previously operated. So something for security professionals to know is that if somebody's on iOS 14, they're not current now. And that that's kind of a, it feels like a change, although Apple is going to say, no, we always meant to do this, which I'm not quite sure I buy. But generally speaking, Apple deserves a ton of credit for the amount of support they give their mobile operating systems. They are still, still shipping iOS updates for iPhone 6S, which came out like in 2015. And so when you hear about all these Android handsets losing security updates after, or, or OS updates after three years, and you think Apple is still shipping iOS updates for a phone that came out seven years ago, they should be commended for that. That is phenomenal, phenomenal stuff that those old of handsets are still current and still getting security updates. So, you know, again, I, I think sometimes stuff like this gets too much attention where it's, oh, look at all these CVEs and Apple stuff is no longer secure because they have all these. As I always point out with this stuff, I, I care less about you claiming to have code that is defect free because such a thing doesn't exist. And I care more about you running a robust bug bounty program, you being respectful to security researchers who take their time to disclose properly vulnerabilities in your code and that you patch it in a timely fashion and you have really strong patching mechanisms in place so that your patches are widely disseminated. And I think on all accounts, Apple has matured so far in this space from where they were, where it was not that long ago, I think only a decade ago, where Apple didn't have a bug bounty program. And so today, I think Apple does a really, really good job with this and deserves to be commended. So I am less concerned about 13 new vulnerabilities and more concerned about Apple ship security updates for phones that came out seven years ago. How about that for a headline? Um, and so just being really, really spinning this in the most positive way I can. Um, not that I'm in the bag for Apple or anything, but I, I like to give the opposite perspective here. And I think it's worth pointing out. I had the same conversation with someone at a, at a company recently where we debated. He was trying to make a compliance policy with an Intune to support multiple versions of an operating system. So, for example, he wanted a compliance policy that said, you know, 15.3 and up, as well as, I don't remember the 12 point, um, I think maybe 12.8 or something like that. But that's for like iPhone 6 and below, right? Like they only went up to like iOS 12, whatever. And so he said, I want to, as long as you're on the 12.8, we'll say, and 15.3 or 15.3, then you're compliant. And I said, why are you asking for that? And that's the most important question as a security professional when you're getting these requests, because it wasn't a security request. It was a business request. The request was from the business because they didn't want to buy new phones. So it was a money saving request so that if people wanted to use older phones, the company didn't have to replace them. And so I said, well, from a security perspective, this is a bad idea because you're not receiving security patches for those phones anymore. So do you really want to assume the risk of one of those phones getting compromised from a security flaw that hasn't been patched. So I, you know, I told them go back to the business and ask them, you know, 
and say, this is the risk that you're assuming. And if you're okay with that, put it in writing and then we'll go on from there. Right. But we're not going to like just accept that and ask to do this because the business is asking to do it. So there's always give and take from a security professional to the business, but from a security professional's perspective, it is your job to tell them what the risk is and not just do what they ask. Right. So that was the conversation that I had. I want to talk about this on another show because we've talked about on this show many times, like security is there to enable the business and advise the business on the risk. But the thing that blows my mind to me is unless this business unit had literally tens of thousands or hundreds of thousands of iPhones six and below, which is, I mean, smartphones don't last that long. So that would be just incredible to think that there's a bunch of eight year old devices still working great, that they have no plans to replace. Like that is so short sighted to refuse to spend the money to upgrade the handsets with all the other benefits that come with it. Like, 5G networking, enhanced CPU speed, enhanced cameras, whatever they're using them for, almost any use case is going to show improved productivity from the upgrade as well as eliminating the massive security risk involved with running software that hasn't been updated in three plus years. You know, like, and and again, I get our job is to advise, enable the business. We say, this is a huge risk. And they go, we accept it. Like, how do you escalate something like that? Because that almost is like, no, like the C the CFO needs to hear about this. If anyone, you know, like, why are we being, why are we pinching pennies to such a degree that we're refusing to spend, you know, six, $700 per handset to, um, open up the company to a huge amount of risk and liability like that. That seems completely short-sighted. So I, I want to talk about that on another show. I don't want to give too off tangent tonight, but gosh, that just makes me go, ah, I can't believe that. <laughs> It's so short-sighted. And and that's right. where I think as security professionals, sometimes you do say, here's the risk. They say, okay, and you go on. And I think sometimes you do have to, you know, ring the bell and say, no, we, we got to talk about this some more. Anyhow. Yep. So another bit of news is President Biden published a 17-page national security memorandum on January 19th. So that was just last week on improving cybersecurity of national security Cybersecurity of National Security, which sounds kind of weird, uh, Department of Defense and intelligent, uh, Intelligence Community Systems. So you might remember we mentioned that there was another memorandum that was written by President Biden back in May of 2021. And that was more of the cybersecurity requirements for uh, all up, like within the federal government. This one is to essentially make sure that the more sensitive systems, so the national security systems are going to employ the same or more stringent cybersecurity measures that were spelled out for the federal civ civilian systems in that memo that was in May of 2021. And if you read through this thing, it's there's a lot of really good information on making sure that these Systems, people in charge of these systems are going to implement MFA within a certain time. They're going to implement zero trust architecture for on-prem and in the cloud. I thought a good call out was really interesting as I read through this memo about encryption. And there's a lot of talk of encryption, but they even called out to say they need to identify any instances of encryption that are not in compliance with NSA approved quantum resistant algorithms. I found that to be really interesting that we already have some quantum al resistant algorithms out there and it would make sense that we're employing them in the national security systems and that the NSA is approving them. So I found that to be really interesting. And then there were other requirements on incident reporting and time to report incidents and all of that. So a lot of good stuff. The initial reaction from both the federal government, uh, Senate, congressmen, uh, civilian sector leaders was all very positive. And I think it's, it's good. Again, we talked about on our show where we see a lot of improvements in the awareness of cybersecurity from nation states, from government agencies, and people are taking steps in the right direction. And I think this is again, one of those steps that 
is just making our government safer. The, the like Adam usually says, a rising tide raises all ships, right? And this is part of that. So good stuff here. Two things I loved in this memorandum that I saw called out on Twitter. Number one, if you are still doing periodic password expiration, you are losing another ally in your fight because this memorandum says that thou shalt not expire passwords that are not known to be compromised and shall not have password complexity requirements either like with different character sets and symbols and all that. It calls out those two things that we've been banging the drum against on this show for quite some time now because NIST standards already did not call for it. Microsoft has been not calling for it since 2015. Uh, and now again, for even our Department of Defense, intelligence community, national security portions of the federal government, they're going to stop doing periodic password expiration. If your passwords expire in your enterprise, you are behind the times. And it is time to move forward, add some length, remove the complexity requirements, check for banned passwords against a known bad password list. Um, Azure AD has that technology, by the way, and we think we did a show on it many moons ago. Uh, but time to move forward. The other thing that was in here that I love too as a call out was it specifically talked about with multi-factor authentication. It wasn't like any MFA is good MFA, which is generally what we say, right? Like any MFA reduces your risk of compromise by 99.9%. It specifically called out the use of phishing resistant MFA methods. So what's a phishing resistant method? Well, hardware tokens are for one. And when I say that, I mean like hardware security keys, like FIDO2 keys, like Yubi keys uh, are definitely a technology here. Phishing resistant essentially means that I can't, I just tricking you as a person isn't sufficient enough to break it. Like with a lot of other things, like I can trick you into giving me your uh, code. I just texted to your SMS, you know, on your, your phone, I can take you to a site that looks like your site and I can steal it or whatever. But with the Yubi key, I can try to trick you all you want. I can send you a phishing email with a link in it and you click it and your Yubi key will go, no, that's not, that's not the site you sign into. I'm not handing anything over there. And, and there's nothing for you to verbally tell. I can't give that to somebody over the phone who's like, Hey, this is so-and-so with the FBI. I need you to give me the code. I just texted your phone. Like I have a Yubi key, dude. I can't give you anything. You know, there's nothing for me to give over. And so, um, Phishing resistant methods was the other call out here that I was really, really excited to see as well. So two things that just jumped out to me. I think Andy hit on the other ones. I am curious to dig into further quantum resistant algorithms. That is very interesting to me. I, to be honest, till we recorded the show tonight, did not know something like that existed. So I'm curious to learn more and go dig into that. Yeah, I'm I'm excited because I am a veteran and I still have access to a veteran system called Military One Source and that's still run by the DOD. And I think I've told you and complained about this before, Adam, where Military One Source requires me to switch my password every sixty days. Sixty days. <laughs> and so I get a I get an email when my password is thirty days out from expiring, which is just 30 days since I last set it. And then I get another email, 15 days. And then once it gets to seven days, I get an email every single day until it expires. So I usually wait until the day of, and then I reset it. But when I emailed them and I sent them the NIST uh, standards, they said, this is a DOD requirement. So I'm hoping <laughs> that this will roll down at some point and they will change that expiration date. Uh, I would even be happy with, 180 days uh, or, or no expiration would be great too, but something better than 60. I think it's coming. So this was also another bit of news. The FBI issued a public warning in 2022 of this year in January of 2022. So just recently about a USB attack campaign in which numerous USBs were laced with malicious software and they were sent to organizations in the transportation, defense, and insurance sectors between August and November of 2021. The USBs came with fake letters impersonating the Department of Health and Human Services and Amazon, and they were sent by the U.S. Postal Service and UPS. 
and the campaign was dubbed Bad USB. And there was a hacker organization or cyber criminal organization that was named as the culprit. So this bad USB attack, what it did was it made a USB stick look like, you know, some sort of, uh, there was usually some sort of letter or something that came along with it that promised like a gift card or thank you or invoice or something, right? It's always something that's urgent or uh, has enticing uh, wording behind it for the user or the victim to plug it into their machine. Once it was plugged in, the USB drive actually was configured to look like a keyboard to Windows. And so the, the computer would identify it as a keyboard and configure it, and then it would automatically start typing in a terminal and invoke a command shell to, to download malware. And a lot of people, you know, it's it's... It probably took advantage of the work from home trend um, where there's less guardrails around like home computer and maybe people are using their work computer or home computer for both or whatever. And so there's less protections around that. But what it really uh, set off a thought in my mind was, you know, are you prepared for this type of attack? I know we've talked about blocking USBs before on this show as far as like ransomware protection. And I know some organizations do it, but what about blocking USB keyboards or blocking USB devices that are not the same type of devices that your organization purchases? Like if your organization purchases only Logitech keyboards and Logitech mice, are you blocking everything else? Because you can do that. And in this case, this USB was configured as a keyboard. So that's something that I never thought of as an attack vector, but it is becoming more and more common. There are a lot of different tactics that attackers are utilizing these days. And this is one of them where if you, I can get you to plug in a USB and the computer recognizes it as, as a keyboard, even if you block mass storage, which is the, typically what most organizations do, they block mass storage because of DLP requirements. Though, so they don't want to exfiltrate data. But this was an attack. It actually is a pen testing tool is really what it is. And, but it was configured as a, as a USB keyboard. So that was really interesting to me uh, how it worked and then kind of set off some thoughts in my head on whether or not organizations are prepared for this type of attack. This is one of those where, you know, we always talk about user education is important but there also needs to be technical guardrails in place as well. I think in this scenario, really user training is the most important tool we have. Um, just in general, just don't put weird stuff. Don't plug weird stuff in your computer that you don't know where it came from. Like just, you want to put it in your mouth, don't put it in your computer kind of thing or something. Um, we can put a lot of technical mitigations in place, but I think those are really going to have to be reserved for companies that have, just very, very high security requirements, just really, really strong security requirements. Um, and, you know, the, the way you go about a lot of this too, or, or think about it from a security perspective is, and I'm not saying like this is not a big deal, but at Microsoft, most people have administrative rights to their local machine. And at a lot of companies, a lot of places, that's considered like complete no-go. Like you can't do that. Um and Microsoft justifies it by that machine itself doesn't have access to really anything, you know, so you can compromise that machine. Big deal. You know, we have very strong identity controls in place that make sure that you can't get to something um, from a machine we've determined is compromised or this or that or anything else. And so it's just, um, I guess I don't know where I'm going with this other than to say, uh, you really have to to check your risk tolerance here with how crazy you want to get on this in terms of shutting it down. Because I'd say with the work from home trend, the other thing that has happened is people have a less standard set of hardware than before versus like before when everyone was in the office, everyone had a Dell monitor, a Dell keyboard and a Dell mouse. And occasionally somebody may have, you know, gone off on their own to office max or staples and bought a, like a, a wireless mouse in or something. But nowadays I mean, you probably have 
hundreds of different keyboards used in your environment and hundreds of different mice because everyone's using whatever they want to use at home. Um, so it would be really, really challenging to shut all of that down. And I think that's where this just gets really, really tricky, but certainly in very hardened, very secure environments, then yeah, more than ever, it might be important to define a, um, trusted set of vendors and hardware and only allow those to be plugged into those very, very, very hardened workstations and stuff, especially like a, like a paw or a saw type scenario. Another bit of news was Microsoft announced that Excel 4.0 XLM macros are now disabled by default to protect customers from malicious documents. These macros were the default Excel macros until Excel 5.0, which was released in 1993. And even though they've been dis- discontinued, threat actors often still use XML to create documents and deploy malware. So I've seen this in organizations as well because people will have file shares with Excel spreadsheets that have been made over the years and they've never converted them over to a newer version of Excel. And so those macros and everything, because if you do, sometimes the macros actually break, but you know, this is a good thing because if you're still using those old spreadsheets, maybe it's time to convert them. Um, one of the tools that we've talked about on this show is config.office.com. If you haven't used it or aren't aware of it, go check it out. When people deploy Office, the application, to a Windows computer, the legacy method was to install it using like SCCM or part of your image, and then you deploy an XML file to configure it. But what happens is that Office client only gets configured for that machine. When you allow a user to download Office from their corporate account to their home computer, which is usually touted as a benefit as part of your Office 365 subscription that you can download it at home. You allow that user to connect to your corporate environment and access like Teams and access uh, OneDrive and all that. And if you don't have conditional access and all that built in, they're going to have access to corporate data. As well as that nice XML file that you had for configuration isn't deployed on that version of Office at home. So what you can do is use office dot, or config.office.com and configure that through the cloud. So what that does is it can configure different policies and it can also generate a configuration for any client that connects to your Office 365 account. And it's really, really good. And one of these benefits of the policy and checking it out there is, let's say I want to disable Excel 5.0 macros. Before I deploy that, I can look at the policy and then I can even see how many people in my organization are accessing Excel files with macros that are Excel 5.0 macros. And I can say, oh, 97% of my organization doesn't use it, but 3% open these documents every day containing these macros. And that's probably something that you need to go and target and find out what documents that they're accessing, why they're doing it, and why they're doing it with these macros, and maybe help them convert that over before you turn on the policy. So I love Office config.office.com. I think it's awesome, and it's something that you should try out. But this is a good thing in general. Like We're moving away from these legacy technologies. We've supported them for a long time because customers have had these documents for a long time, but now we're we're disabling it by default and you know that's good for security on the same note i saw a blog post from december of 2021 so last month where it was announced that in protected view you know that kind of limited view when you first open an office document and a lot of stuff is disabled well as it turns out users used to be able to override like set a setting that would still allow some active content in protected view. So a user could say at the user configuration level, yeah, I still want you to do active content of some kind, which can be like external links, active X controls, all sorts, you know, macros, all sorts of weird stuff. And now that setting behavior is going to change moving forward in the office applications or as they're called, the Microsoft 365 apps for enterprise, where if an administrator sets the setting that says no, disable active content in protected view, that cannot be overridden by the user any longer. 
So on the same note of limiting the attack surface of the office client, that's another one of those ways you can do that. And then just a quick mention on a third option. Now this does require you to have E5 security or higher in your Microsoft 365 environment. But we've talked on the show about hypervisor based security. And one of those tools is application guard. And this is where it actually runs a hypervisor isolated instance of the office client that also will protect against malicious active content in office documents. And even if it does something bad, it's in a sandbox anyways, and hyper V can blow it up and you're no harm, no foul on your main, you know, machine, essentially your main operating system uh, instance. So that's something else to look into. Again, if you have very, very strong security controls, or you're just interested in limiting the blast radius of potentially harmful office files, application guard for the, Microsoft 365 apps for enterprise uh, is available and is something else you could look at as well to help with um, situations like this. And finally, to round it out, at CES 2022, Lenovo announced the first Microsoft Pluton-powered Windows 11 PCs. We've talked about Microsoft Pluton. It is a processor that first appeared in the Xbox console and Azure Sphere. And what it does is combine the CPU and the TPM, the trusted platform module, into one piece of silicon so that you can't man in the middle and sniff the bus between the CPU and the TPM. You also have other protections from physical attack of the actual chip. And, you know, we had this show where we broke down how administrators when they got access or or uh or hackers i should say got access to a computer and they were able to put these little leads on the tiny physical portion of the tpm chip because the tpm was never designed against physical attacks it, it was just designed to store the key uh f- for for different things right it's a security chip and and a lot of times it was an add-on chip to the cpu And so there's leads that you can hook up and, you know, sniff the ones and zeros and basically sniff a a bit locker key or something like that. Um, So there's other things that um, Pluton uh, enabled processors will protect against like uh, firmware attacks, you know, specter meltdown security issues, you know, show that an attacker can sit between the CPU process and the operating system and can read, you know, the data that's being transmitted between them and mitigating Spectre and Meltdown came at a cost in the performance of the processor. A lot of times you have to have a firmware upgrade in order to mitigate any type of hardware vulnerabilities, which is not an easy process. I can tell you firmware is generally only updated by a user with admin privileges who has identified, oh, this device needs a firmware update or you have some sort of vendor provided software like an HP or Lenovo, you know, vendor provided software that you install and then they scan the machine and then they update their firmware. And usually at most enterprises that only happens when there's an issue for the computer and it's brought into it and they're updating drivers and they're like, Oh, there's a firmware update. We'll go ahead and do that as well. But you can go three years without ever having to bring in your machine into it and your firmware may never get updated. So, you know, I'll, I'll just say for Surface devices, this is why I choose Surface devices for my family or, or Mac devices because this is the same concept where firmware and OS updates come through the same update channel. So if you have a Mac, you're very familiar with this, right? You get firmware updates through the Mac update system. Same thing with Surfaces. It's the only you know, device that will give you uh, firmware updates for that, for that surface device, because they're coming right from Microsoft. Right. So um, you should worry about them because again, if attackers get physical access to the systems, they can exploit it through firmware vulnerabilities. And then, you know, the question comes to mind is, should you upgrade right away to these Pluton enabled uh, devices? Well, One, 
you're probably going to purchase new hardware because of some of the requirements of Windows 11. So maybe that's something you think about. And of course, you're going to get added protection. But maybe, you know, like we, as we talked about with the the paw and the saw just a few minutes ago, maybe you're just going to buy them for those machines or you're evaluating your level of risk and your threat profile. And maybe it's not something that you need to worry about because a lot of people think the device is not as important these days because it's just a conduit and you need to spend more time protecting authentication and identity versus the device itself, especially against physical attacks, right? This is a physical vulnerability and it's really very difficult to pull off. It's not just like someone with minimal skills, like a script kitty can figure this out. So, you know, if you have some sort of insider threat, um, uh, threat model and you, you know, that person could take advantage of a firmware attack or device level hardware vulnerability. Maybe it's something you think about uh, for those highly sensitive systems. This is probably something I would implement, but for normal users, maybe not. Right. There is an old saying that used to go something like this. If you have physical access, then you have access. It was kind of the assumption that we can do a lot of hardening against casual attacks, drive-by attacks, um, but more focused on network-based attacks anyway, since they're obviously way cheaper and way easier to uh, attempt versus physical attacks are obviously very risky, um, both in terms of your physical safety as well as your risk for you know, being imprisoned or at least accused of a, of a crime. Um, and running into law enforcement and all that. And so all that's to say, Xbox is an interesting, you might say, well, that's an interesting place for this to come from. It came from Xbox. But Xbox, of course, the last two generations of it, Xbox One and Xbox Series, have both been essentially an x86 PC architecture. They use AMD graphics. They use AMD processors like APUs, CPUs. Um, for their main processing unit. And again, they're, they run x86. They actually run a custom version of Windows. They actually do run um, like a stripped down version of Windows 10, essentially. And yet at the same time, Xbox is only designed to run cryptographically signed code, like only a cryptographically signed operating system image, only cryptographically signed game applications, game executables. It's not a general purpose computer, right? It's very limited in what it can run and what it can execute. And so there are millions of Xboxes sitting in people's homes that could be under physical attack by hackers, security researchers, script kitties, whomever, who would love to get it to run Doom, <laughs> because that's what you do on everything when you crack into it, is you run Linux on it and then run Doom, right? And yet the integrity of the Xbox, as far as I know, is still intact. Um, almost every you know, major console over many years has been owned in some way or another where if you had a certain game and a certain peripheral, you could use that as your like way to break in. And then from there, you could basically get root access and do whatever you want. I remember way back in the day on the original Xbox, you could exploit it with a malformed uh, saved game and Tom Clancy's Splinter Cell. So I owned a copy of Splinter Cell for the sole purpose of cracking people's Xboxes and putting emulators on them because the original Xbox was an awesome emulation machine, which, by the way, the original Xbox was also x86 hardware-based. It was a Pentium 3, um, and it was NVIDIA graphics at the time. The only Xbox that was not x86 architecture was the Xbox 360, which ran on PowerPC, for those who are care or not. Um, and so you think of like, oh, yeah, it was once they found that exploit, it was trivial to exploit an original Xbox and keep it exploited. But on current Xbox hardware, you can't. And so a lot of that is due to this interplay of silicon and software where that silicon enforces a trusted root and trust all the way down the chain from the time the machine boots to the time the OS boots, we can validate Every part of that boot chain is cryptographically intact from what we expect it to be. And 
that is what is coming to the PC. And so what's interesting about this, Andy talked about all the benefits about, you know, less vulnerability to hardware-based attacks because it's on the same die as the CPU itself. It's integrated into the CPU. And when this was announced, it was announced that Microsoft would be working with all three major PC silicon providers. So that was AMD, Intel, and Qualcomm were all called out on this. Now, this first one is with AMD, which makes sense because, again, AMD provides both the APU and GPU in Xbox. So as this has this Xbox heritage, it makes a ton of sense. Of course, that's who was first. Um, Intel is still expected to come along as well as Qualcomm. And they're, in its current state, for the most part, you can have it act as a TPM and do all that TPME stuff that TPMs do today. But there is more functionality above and beyond just what TPM does. It's just not really tapped into yet. Because first it's, let's get this into market. Let's get it out there. And then we can grow its feature set over time because there's a lot more capabilities there that can be unlocked as, you know, a PC firmware and Windows kind of catch up with that. And um, the one other thought on this is uh, you talked about being able to be upgraded seamlessly. And that is correct. Updates for Pluton come through Windows Update. That's all I have to say about that. <laughs> oh, okay. <laughs> so I, I love it's Xbox heritage because as a gamer, I think anyone who's a gamer knows that we've all tried to crack these consoles at one point or another. I own the original PlayStation and I tried to mod it and copy games and play cracked PlayStation games. It's something that gamers have done since the beginning of time. And I love that this security silicon basically came from gamers, you know, OG hackers, if you want to call us that. And it's now the security community and the PC is, is reaping the benefits of that. So um, I'm super excited to see where this goes and certainly will be a benefit for anyone who is getting a Pluton powered PC. So that's our show for this week. Thanks as always for listening and watching. Our contact information will be in the show notes if you guys have any questions or want to reach out to us for topics that you want us to talk about. Thanks, and we'll talk to you guys next week. Thank you for listening to the Blue Security Podcast. Please check out the show notes, catch up on episodes you may have missed, and subscribe so you don't miss any future episodes. Find Andy on Twitter at AJawZero and Adam at AJ Brewer. See you at our next episode.